Hi, my name is Xie and I'm an SAT math tutor. A bit about myself. I have a degree in engineering and have been tutoring students on and off for the past five years. I currently live in the US and tutor a variety of students. One thing that has become glaringly obvious is that the education system here is a one-size-fits-all. No system is perfect, but in my opinion, the education system only focuses on the average student. Students that learn a little differently tend to be left behind. Meanwhile, students with exceptional abilities are forced to slow down to accommodate their peers. Today, I'm going to show you how I interact with and teach some of my students of varying abilities. Stick around to watch my star pupil at work. If you'd like watching these sorts of videos, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. The first student you're going to see here is Brandon. Brandon is currently in the 10th grade and working on Algebra 2 Honours. When I first met Brandon, he was struggling with his grades and had a D in Geometry. Brandon clearly needed additional attention and help. However, his teachers failed to provide that. I quickly learned through trial and error that Brandon excels best at following a strict outline. Here you'll watch an interaction between me and Brandon. You'll notice before I even start attempting the problem with Brandon, I provided him a little table here so that he would be able to identify what kind of function the question is asking for. Question 4, so same thing always, even or odd, positive or negative? So that's going to be a uh, positive, even. Positive, even, very good, with how many turning points? Three. Three, very good, so it's going to look like that W, does that make sense? Mm. So, by asking Brandon guiding questions, he's able to identify exactly which function we have to use. So, if you do, if you check one turning point, two turning point, three turning point, like that. So, it does look like this. Does this all make sense so far? All right, so when x goes to negative infinity, remember, x going to negative infinity is the left side or the right side? The left. All right, good. x goes to negative infinity is on the left. And where is y going? Is y going up or down? Why is going to positive infinity? Very good. Why will be going to positive infinity? So with the arrowhead, Brandon is able to see that y is actually going up, and hence y will be going to positive infinity. What about the right side when x goes to positive infinity? Where is y going? Um. Also positive infinity. There we go. Very good. Okay, let's look at this one. Question five. Sketch the. So you'll notice this question is really similar to the previous one. I repeat the whole process over with Brandon, but this time he's going to be able to solve it a little more self-sufficiently. The general shape of each function, well, it's kind of like this thing. You just have to figure out, is it even? Is it odd? Is it positive? Is it negative? And then try to draw, find number of turning points to draw. So kind of like question five. Um, this is even or odd? Even. Even, positive or negative? Positive. Positive with how many turning points? Three. Three, very good. So since it's even and positive, it means we start up or down. If you look at the graph here, it's this one, right? The, yeah. So it's do a w. That. Yeah, it's like a W. So just make sure we just draw the W. One, two, three. There. Does this make sense to you? Brandon just needed a blueprint to follow, but his teachers never noticed his particular learning style. In addition, Brandon is an extremely hard-working student, and whenever we worked on a new formula, he would have it memorized by the next session. As a result, Brandon has gone from being a below-average student to getting an A in geometry by the end of the year. Now, you're going to see my session with Katie. Katie is in the 7th grade and is advanced for her grade. She's currently in Algebra 1 and has Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Sometimes Katie gets distracted and her mind wanders. However, when she's focused, she never fails to astound. Here, you can see Katie is working on factorization with quadratic functions. She hasn't learned it in school yet, but because she is so far ahead, I have to challenge her with advanced topics for her age. Question 18. So, same technique. We find A, B, and C first. Can you tell me what is A, B, and C? Um, A would be 1, B mm. would be negative 1. Very good. And C, C would be negative 90. 
Exactly. All right. Can you tell me what would our A times C here be? Um, negative 90. Very good. And we need to find the factors of? Um, 90. Very good. We find the factors of 90 there. So due to KT's attention span, I have to be very structured in how I teach here so that we can keep up with the flow. Quite a few. Can you list them out starting from one? It will be um, 1 and 90, mm -hmm. two. 2 and 45. Very good. What's the next pair? 3 and 30. 3 and 30. Very good. After that? Um, 5 and 18. Very good. 5 and 18. Any more? Um, 6 and... Um, so, six times, so 90 divided by 6 would give us? Um, it would be 15. So notice how I try to prevent Laos when teaching Katie. This is to prevent her mind from wandering. Very good. Yes, yeah, 6 and 15. And after 6 and 15, what would we have? One more pair. Um, 9 and 10. Very good. 9 and 10. All right. So I also try to give as much encouragement as I can to her because this is a very hard concept. All right. Are we going to be... Adding or subtracting the factors? Um, you would be subtracting the factors. Very good, we would be subtracting the factors. And we must subtract to what number? Um, negative 1. Very good. Can you tell me which pair of factors will subtract to negative 1? Um, 9 minus 10. Very good. Positive 9 minus 10. Good job. All right, can you put it all in the parentheses? No, we just put A at the front first. A what and A what? A plus 9 and A minus 10. Very good. You did a really good job. All right, let's look at question 19. So also, so you'll notice this question is similar to the previous one. And you'll also see me using the same prompts with Katie. So this way, Katie knows what she needs to answer ahead of time. Very similar. Can you tell me what is A, B, and C here too? Um, A would be 1, B would be 11, C would be 10. Very good. All right, and we need to find the factors of? Um, C, which would be 10. Exactly, we're finding the factors of C, and what are the factors of C? There are only two pairs. It would be um, 1 and 10 and 2 and 5. Very good. All right, are we adding them or subtracting them? Um, you would be adding them. Very good. We need to add to what number? Um, 11. Exactly. All right, and which pair adds to 11? It would be 1 and 10. Very good. It would be 1. So this question is simpler than the previous one since it has fewer factors. And because of that, you can see Katie is much more confident in solving this question. 1 and 10. Alright, can you put it in the parentheses now? Um, it would be A plus 1 and A plus 10. I get that in this scenario it's P, but so it's, oh. so it's you see that KT makes a tiny mistake when identifying the variable. She says A instead of P, but that's okay because this shows that she was able to put what we covered in the previous question into this problem. P plus one and P plus ten. Yeah, good job. So yeah, if it says if they use A, you can put A. If they use P, just use P. So just follow whatever letter letter they use. Katie just needed a structured teaching approach. She was able to solve the problems with ease, showing that ADHD doesn't hold back students from reaching their potential. Not all students respond the same. As a tutor, it is my responsibility to find the appropriate delivery that each student responds to. Next, you'll be meeting Zoe. Zoe is currently a senior in high school preparing for the SAT. Zoe has double vision, which means that it is difficult for her to read and understand questions. In this equation, we've got y equals to 4 and y equals to x plus 2 squared minus 5. They want to know exactly where do they intersect. So they aren't asking for number of solutions, they're asking for where do they intersect. So let's think. Are they asking us to solve or are they asking us um, for number of solutions? 
So as you can see, I started by asking Zoe some guiding questions. Zoe gets confused when the questions do not directly tell her what to do. So it's important to get her to ask herself, what is the question's motive? Uh, they're asking us to solve. Exactly, they're asking us to solve. So it's kind of similar to the last question we worked on. We have y equals to 4, y equals to this. Can you just combine them into one equation first? What will we have? Yes, so it's going to be 4 equals to x plus 2 square root 2 minus 5. Mm -hmm. Now, what should we shift? I mean, not square root 2, sorry, squared. Minus yeah. 5. And then you're going to shift 4, so subtract by 4. Mm, instead of shifting 4, can we shift to 5? So here, Zoe tries to solve the question by using the zero product theorem instead of using the complete the square method that the question was alluding to. Oh yeah, I thought it had to all equal to Mm -hmm. zero. Now, if it was in vertex form, they've already, they've already kind of done the complete the square for you. Okay. You have to, um, you don't, you don't want to follow this and then have to solve for zero. Instead, it's much easier to just shift everything to the other side and then get rid of the square. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So then that would just, that would just be, um, just plus five on the other side. See, so the moment I pointed it out, Zoe was able to easily change costs. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's sorry. That's gonna be nine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Equals to x plus two. Oh, uh, squared. There we go. And how so you'll notice the editing will be a bit choppy from here on because I had to block out um some identifying information. Do we get rid of squares? A uh, square root. So right. now you're gonna have a uh, three, and then x equals to x plus two. Almost. Remember, when we square root, we have two answers, so it's going to be 3 or... Or negative 3. There we go. Alright, can you solve for x? We have x plus 2 equals 3 or negative 3. How do we just get x? Um, you're going to subtract 2 on the other side. Yes, we're going to subtract 2, so now we have... Uh, you would have uh, x equals to 1 or negative... Uh, five. Exactly, there we go. Alright, so let's look at the solutions provided. We know x equals to 1 or negative 5. Let's see if we can... Uh, so it would, just, it would just be a. Oh no, I mean, sorry, it would be b. Exactly. There we go, it would be b. So we just needed help to identify keywords to find the right approach. She knows how to solve the problems. She just needs a little help finding the best approach. Now, you'll be meeting Mark. It is rare to find students with a gift for math. Mark is one of these students and it pains me to see such students having to work on topics that they've already mastered when they could be working on more difficult topics on par with their abilities. Or a dodecagon is? Well, I mean, like, no, but, like, it kind of says it, right? Yeah, exactly. So even if you don't know, it says it is. So they want you to find this area of this 12-sided polygon. So do you remember the trick to finding area of polygons? Yeah. You cut it into? So, so you just like cut it into like triangles. So here you can see I'm letting Mark decide what approach he's going to use to solve the problem. This is to help Mark develop his problem-solving skills. Very good. Yeah, so we have a circle, radius 1. And they're drawing their polynom they're drawing their polygon in here like that. Does it make sense? Yeah. So it doesn't so I know this is not exactly twelve sides, but even if we cut it, can you see that um can you see what is going to be the length of each side of the triangle? Yeah. If the radius is one, then the length of each side would be. So it'd be like one one. One one, very good. And what is the angle up here? It'd be thirty degrees. Yeah, very good, 30 degrees. So, do you remember the formula for area of a triangle, the sine one, half AB sine C? Do you remember this? Yeah. So, actually, even though Mark didn't really remember the formula, you can still see he was able to apply it. Alright, so can you, all you have to do is just plug in our A, B, and C into the formula to find the area of one triangle first. So, one triangle would be? So you'd have one half mm -hmm. times. And times 
one, mm -hmm. just like sine 30. One, one, sine 30. You remember what sine 30 is? Uh, one half. Very good. Yeah, so we just have one half times one times one times one half, right? So that'll be a quarter. Very good. It would be a quarter. This is a 12-sided polygon, so if one triangle is one quarter, how many triangles is the polygon made of? So, polygon would be made out of... Oh, so just three would be a circumference, right? So, actually, I think he meant area, but he said circumference, so you'll see me just being a nit little nitpicky with Mark here. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. Yeah. You just want the area? Yeah, so the area. So you just do, like, 12 times 1 4 for us, it'd be yeah. 10. Yeah, exactly. Our answer is just going to be 3. That's it. Does this make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. The question you just watched Mark solve was the first questions in the entrance exam to Oxford University. Mark is currently 14 years old, yet he's able to use concepts far beyond his age group. With me, Mark has learned synthetic division, calculus, and much more. A student's ability is not bound by age, as Mark clearly shows. Mark just needed to work on tougher topics to keep him engaged. I hope you enjoyed watching the video. I'll be covering some common SAT math problems next time, with some tips and tricks to help make solving these problems easier. If you have any problems you'd like me to tackle, make sure to leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching!